Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Growing Concerns for July the 10th. Uh, I'm going to start today with uh, basically just going to be an update for the, uh, the whole uh, webinar today. going to go th through a few things that uh, have been coming up over the past week as well as maybe a bit of a heads up of uh, some of the things we should be, uh, should be looking at for, for this coming week as well. Um, conditions are pretty good out there, crop is growing fast, so things are happening pretty fast out there and uh, I think that's probably one of the keys uh, right now is because things are happening so fast we need to be on, uh, on top of everything that's going on. So I guess with that we'll uh, get started with the first slide here and uh, again just a little bit of an update. Uh, last week uh, rainfall again uh, we had, uh, I guess that's one of the things that's uh, maybe been causing a few of the issues is uh, we've got a fair bit of rainfall throughout the, the southwest here and uh, we're seeing a lot of the, uh, the low-lying areas having standing water now and uh, we're getting crop yellowing in a, in a lot of those areas uh, and it's actually extending out uh, when, you, when you drive by and you see the water in the field uh, the, the issue is actually farther out than just the water. We're starting to see some of that crop yellow off as well already and um, talking to some producers uh, that are uh, traveling across the fields right now applying fungicides. Uh, actually some of the areas are larger than they thought and I'm getting you know comments anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of some of the acres or some of the seeded acres that are now uh, underwater or been severely affected by water. So it's uh, definitely having a, an effect the, uh, the moisture we've been getting and it's probably in the long run going to affect a little bit the yields as well. Spraying for weeds uh, nearly complete in most areas and, uh, and I guess uh, with that uh, we're, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, you know, maybe some, uh, some issues with some chemicals starting to show up and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, a lot of the late spraying going on now is maybe some second pass canola and maybe we're seeing some issues with uh, producers not cleaning the sprayers out properly after you know going back in and, and doing a top up on their canola. Also uh, some of the later crops that are being sprayed we uh, haven't had the greatest conditions so we're maybe seeing some drift, drift issues starting to, to come up as well. Pretty much most of the cereal crops are being sprayed for disease uh, and the staging for fusarium control is, is closing pretty fast on us here right now. Uh, I would say that uh, if you haven't sprayed for fusarium, uh, your window is, uh, is it, if it hasn't closed already, it's almost there and so you know, needing to make decisions uh, with products you're using if uh, you're still thinking of going out there for fusarium control, maybe there's a product out there that you might be able to use that's a little bit cheaper and do the same job for leaf disease control. Uh, some producers have been spraying for sclerotinia, however, uh, again, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing this year with our canola crops, and we've talked about it before, is some of the fields don't warrant a, an application. And I guess one of the things to always remember, and it's in uh, as well, uh, you know, the canola council has been, been mentioning this as well, you don't have yields, uh, potential yields of 25 plus bushels in the field. Uh, probably the, uh, the the addition of a fungicide is probably not going to uh, really sh show you any major or enough returns to uh, to justify the application cost. So there's something to keep in mind when you're out there looking at your fields. And uh, a little bit about soybeans. We can talk a little bit about soybeans as we go through, but uh, the majority of the soybean crop is progressing really well. Actually, uh, it's growing. It seems to, uh, we've seen this last year and, and we're seeing it again this year, it's, it seems to be able to handle the wet conditions, so it's doing really well right now. And most of it is, uh, uh, our, I guess the biggest thing we have is we have a fairly wide, wide range of stages out there. We've got the guys that planted early and there's their are in the R1 stage or maybe even a little past that now. So what that means is they're flowering and I'm going to go through some of the stages a little bit later and then we got some that are in the, the V1 stage which would be the first trifoliate uh, you know, uh, out already. And uh, so uh, again as we go through the, uh, the presentation I'll show a few, a little bit more about the staging of the soybeans. As we've been doing on a weekly basis we've been tracking the winter wheat field that uh, 
who's been in the Shoal Lake area that uh, Elmer's been uh, visiting once a week to just see how it's been advancing. And this is what that field looked like last week. And when you look at it this week, uh, you know, definitely got uh, got a field of winter wheat there, and uh, was a good thing that the producer uh, left this field and didn't uh, didn't panic too much about it because the crop has definitely turned into uh, uh, a healthy winter wheat stand and uh, probably one of the, the better stands or better fields I've seen uh, by picture wise anyways uh, in in southwest here so definitely a crop that uh, was able to handle uh, the uh, the poorer start we had this year and the questionable germination last fall so uh, uh, just let you know that sometimes the winter we can be very aggressive and make it through. Cam been doing this on a weekly basis as well. We've been going through the, um, you know, where we sit weather-wise. So we'll moisture over the past eight days, and you look at the uh, rainfall we've had. It's been anywhere from, you know, seven to forty-five mils, and in some areas reporting even higher. Uh, isolated areas. The big thing I like to talk about each day is our growing degree days because as uh, we're looking at more of the special crops, soybeans, corn, uh, we're, all, we're, we're always wanting to make sure where we're sitting in our growing degree days. And you can see, you know, over the past while here, we've prepped over the 100% of normal in most areas, which, uh, which is definitely good because uh, we are a little bit behind the eight ball in the spring, uh, getting a lot of these crops in. And this is going to help us, uh, uh, you know, get the get those crops growing and you can definitely see it when you drive by the corn and soybean crops and the sunflower crops do. Uh, they're definitely uh, stretching out and uh, and and growing and uh, that's going to make a difference and hopefully uh, you know bring it uh, bring it in a little bit earlier than we were hoping. The other thing we've been tracking the growing degree days for is for the emergence of some insects especially wheat midge and uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that later on as we, uh, we go through the, uh, the presentation today. Look at the rainfall. Uh, you know, where most areas uh, definitely received uh, over and above their share this year. There's still a couple areas that are just uh, a tad below their normal, but uh, really uh, we've uh, we've been on the high side of moisture, and uh, I think most areas are hoping that we can uh, kind of stave off the, the moisture a little bit over the next little while, let the heat help the crop grow, and then maybe get a little bit of a a shot of rain just at, uh, at full heading time to help those heads fill out and potting time to help those pods fill out. But uh, you know, for the next while here, it should be nice if we could uh, avoid any major rainfall anyways. I guess with that, uh, um, so much for avoiding the rainfall. Uh, this uh, was just posted uh, last night, I guess, uh, or yesterday on uh, on, the, on the Brandon uh, website and. Um, I guess about a couple of weeks ago, we had some storm chasers up in the area, and uh, this is a report from one of them. Uh, yesterday, I came on, and this is going to be for this Thursday. It's a Reed Timmer, and I guess he's saying that the forecast models for southeast Saskatchewan and southwest Manitoba are uh, are looking like there might be some severe weather coming through. And uh, again, hopefully, it's not going to be. Uh, as severe as what they're looking at right now. It's not a warning or anything yet, but it's just something that they've been tracking. I talked to uh, Mike Warblitsky, who's been on the webinars uh, the last few times talking about he's kind of our go-to weather guy, and he's uh, I talked to him this morning about it, and uh, he said that he's been looking at some of the models. Right now there are some uh, weak, uh, weak lows, uh, I guess they call them, I guess in Saskatchewan, that they're monitoring. And he is going to be, uh, again, monitoring them all day today as well. So uh, again, I think it's just something we need to be aware of. These are the, uh, I guess, the cells that were posted on the site. And I'm not really a weather guy, so I don't, uh, can't really explain what, uh, what these are. I was kind of hoping Mike would be able to be on this morning and do this for us. But you can see it looks like. Uh, it's a fairly intense cell right across Saskatchewan and through Manitoba, so uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, if it has the ability to miss us and if anything reduce the amount of rainfall we're going to get anyway. So, I guess with that, uh, you know, the uh, 
done talking about weather and I'm going to uh, uh, look at uh, some of the soybean things that are happening out in the field and um, I mentioned that uh, our stages out there are fairly variable right now and mainly because we had some guys putting it in uh, as early as they could and then we had some guys waiting for the soil to warm up and so we're just seeing uh, a lot of different stages out there in the field. And uh, this is a picture, and I took this one from off the Iowa State University Extension, and it's uh, it just shows a nice uh, V1 stage. And I mentioned that we had some crops still in the V1 stage. Uh, I would say that 90% of the fields out there are are past this stage, uh, but we do. I did see the odd field that was still in this stage, and uh, these are the ones that I'm a little bit worried about because they got a long way to go yet. But warm weather is definitely going to help. But what they mean by the V1 stage is you have the first trifoliate of leaves showing right there. Uh, this one actually has the second one starting to come, but uh, it's not unfolded yet, so that's why it would still be called the V1 stage. When you look at uh, going to the second trifoliate stage, you have two sets of the V of the trifoliates open, and here's one uh, that I was able to take. Uh, and uh, you know, there's the, the two trifoliates that are there. The third one's coming right there. So this one is well on its way into the actually the, the you know it's pat, in the V2 stage, but getting into the almost into the V3 stage already. And uh, basically, the way the stages work is as those leaves keep unfolding, the the V number just keeps going up until you start getting uh, flowers starting to show. And I'll be talking a little bit about flowering right away. But I would say 50% of the fields are at or past this stage uh, in the in the southwest uh, right now. And then uh, the next picture here, uh, we're seeing uh, some of them beginning to flower already and you can see the the, the blossom starting to, uh, to show right there. And uh, this would be already called the R1 stage. And I would say that uh, we probably have about 25% of the fields in this area that are in this stage already, so starting to flower. So that's going to be the height you're going to have uh, from here to there is ground level, so that'll be where your first pods start to develop. So we did get some extension uh, of the plant, uh, which is good, and make it a little bit easier for harvest. But we are going to have, uh, you know, some fairly low, low-lying pods this year, and we're going to be, uh, be have to be, uh, I guess, uh, aware of that when it comes time for harvest, because it's uh, it definitely is uh, is and can be uh, can be an issue when we get into harvest. Regarding canola and uh, and spraying of the canola crop, uh, getting a lot of questions over the last little while as to uh, you know uh, should I be spraying, shouldn't I be spraying, and uh, it's uh, it's really a question this year. You, it's a field by field basis and not a farm by farm basis. It's a field by field basis because uh, one field is uh, is great. It cabbaged out. It is doing well, and then the next field. Uh, you know, a quarter mile over across the fence line, uh, just uh, for some reason the stage it was in when the moisture stress came, uh, it just uh, decided it wanted to bolt and probably more of a timing of seeding than anything and because it's, it was bolting it didn't get a chance to cabbage out very much and those plants are, are a lot more spindly and, and not uh, just not doing as well. So. I guess if the decision that comes down to it and you're deciding to spray and that's some of the questions we're getting right now is is you know should I be out there spraying um, make sure you're you're looking at the right things when you're going out to make the judgment call uh, make sure you're not too late uh, there are a lot of fields that are are you know over 50 percent bloom already and uh, I still see some tracks happening in them in those fields and uh, one thing you want to avoid as much as you can is try to avoid too much petal drop and this picture here is showing petal drop, and uh, and once you get see petal drop on the, on the plants, you're usually you know that 30% plus uh, kind of uh, bloom stage. So uh, walk into your field if you see petals on the ground or on the leaves, you know your minimum 30%. Uh, most of the the products that you're going to be using out there, uh, recommendations are anywhere from 20 to 50% bloom. So you know you're probably looking at uh, if you're out there and you're seeing petals, uh, you're at 30. In a couple of days' time, you're going to be knocking the 50. So if you're not going to be able to get it sprayed in a couple of days' time, you're probably not going to be getting full value out of out of the product that you're spraying. And the chances of uh, 
sclerotinia, if it was going to be issue, uh, the sclerotinia could be uh, already a problem. And, and the reason we're talking pedal drop is just because the, uh, the spores for sclerotinia will be on the pedals, and as they fall down, that's how they reinfect the plants. So yeah, those pedals uh, will be carrying the infection if the, if the, the field is infected. Was getting some calls regarding, uh, you know, how do you determine, you know, the the lower or the small, uh, or the early time for spraying, or the 10% bloom, and if you grab the main stem and if you can count 10 open flowers on it, uh, that's 10% bloom. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an indication as to as to where to go there as well. Uh, I did show some uh, some pictures last webinar regarding uh, the staging, but it's just sometimes it's hard to tell if you're driving by your field all the time. So this will give you kind of an indication of what 10% is, and then if you're seeing cattle drop, you're at 30%. So, you know, you're, uh, you've got a, the window right there where you should be targeting to, to be spraying. Um, regarding uh, fungicide, I'm going to keep going on fungicides here for a little bit uh, because we're uh, getting to kind of the the staging where we're uh, going to be either wrapping up fungicides for the year or, uh, you know, uh, looking at, uh, in some cases, in flax uh, just starting. And uh, headline on flax uh, has been something that uh, I guess producers have been uh, doing a fair bit over the last few years and definitely seen some positive responses. And uh, the, the key with that one is uh, watch your field. If you're starting to see flowering, uh, usually right after you start seeing the flowering, about seven to ten days after the first flowers, is when you'd be going out there to, uh, to hit it with headline. If conditions are favorable and uh, if you look like your field, you know, you're scouting your field and you've got some disease, or it looks like there's disease issues in it, you can do it again after the ten days. But most guys are getting away with just uh, the one application. And like I said, uh, the seven to ten days after for after seeing first flowers. So a lot of the flax fields are just starting to uh, open up flowers right now. So you know we're we're looking at uh, you, know, um, you know by the uh, middle of next week would be the the time for for hitting those fields uh, with uh, with headline. Disease we're controlling there is pasmo and. Um, uh, what usually happens, and uh, if you uh, don't spray, and a lot of times you'll see a lot of areas in flax fields where they tend to lodge and don't produce a lot of uh, a lot of bulls and very little seed. And uh, when you go to swath, it's fairly dusty in those areas. Uh, that's what's normally are usually happening in those areas. This pasmos head, and basically what it does is it. It girdles the stem, weakens the stem, and that's why it lodges, and it cuts off nutrients going to the, the, the plant, and the plant isn't able to develop uh, the way it normally would. Jumping over to some of the cereal crops now, uh, Fusarium head blight. Um, the, uh, this is last week's map, and uh, uh, up until the, the 9th of July, uh, which I guess is uh, yesterday. And you can see that the risk level, according to this map, has uh, dropped off from the previous week. The previous week, most of the map was was red. I'd uh, just like to throw a little bit of a caution out there as well. Uh, I know uh, um, one of the things I usually like to look at is if you're walking out into your field uh, any time between noon and one, 1 to 2 o'clock and you're still getting your pant lakes wet, uh, uh, we have issues with uh, with uh, the possibility of disease being a problem because conditions are favorable in that crop. And uh, I know yesterday afternoon uh, I was still seeing conditions where we were where a crop was uh, was wet. And uh, so I guess uh, every area is going to be different. Uh, we have some areas uh, you know that have received a fair bit of rainfall. And that crop, uh, anything below the crop canopy, is it, just not getting the opportunity to dry out. We do have some some fairly heavy uh, cereal crops out there, and uh, so uh, if uh, if you're still in the window where an application for a fusarium can be done, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to go out there and just scout that field and and see what you're seeing. But uh, 
uh, I would say that uh, the chances are our, our risk is maybe a little bit higher than uh, than uh, I guess moderate to low. So um, regarding the uh, the staging for Fusarium, we've talked about it uh, the last couple of webinars, and I've been uh, guys sending in some pictures over the last week here, uh, seeing a lot of wheat heads uh, that are uh, are flowering and and we're, you know basically uh, the, the uh, petals are sitting on the, on the heads already. That at that point is is done flowering. So if you're seeing that in your field, just a reminder again that that is past flowering, and that window would be closed then for for fusarium control. And your best op option next is to uh, to try to keep the uh, the leaf disease down. And uh, that would be uh, you know uh, looking uh, all the products that you would be spraying for fusarium are are your good pods for for leaf disease. However, some of them are, are a little bit more expensive than some of the other ones, so there's where you might be able to do some um, some uh, budgeting and maybe reduce some of your cost if you're past the point for fusarium control. Regarding barley, barley is a little bit different for fusarium control. It's got an open head, and uh, so controlling fusarium on barley is going to be a, lo a lot more difficult, and uh, if conditions are good for fusarium for three weeks, then the potential for barley to be infected is all over those that whole three week period. So you can help barley out by spraying for fusarium, but you're not going to get the same type of results as you would be looking at if you were spraying uh, for fusarium in, in wheat. Some of the, uh, the areas are definitely showing uh, 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 heavy disease pressure. On, on our cereal crops, and uh, here's a flag leaf uh, was taken in uh, the uh, the western side of the province here in the, the I guess the Sinclair area, and you can definitely see uh, several different uh, spots on the leaf. And uh, in a situation like this, uh, you know, a recommendation would definitely be to get out there and get it sprayed as quick as you can, whether uh, the fusarium stage is is passed or not. I think. Uh, you know, if you can get some fungicide on a leaf like that and, and, and stop the disease for a couple of weeks and then the plant would, you know, need to be reinfected by that time, a lot of the, uh, the head would have filled already and we can maybe start losing some of the leaf and it wouldn't be as big of an issue. Gone unchecked, a leaf like that might only last, uh, you know, a week and a half and you wouldn't get the full potential of filling the head so you could uh, definitely see some yield loss. Basically, we're looking at tan spot and septoria on a leaf like that, and uh, again, you know, diseases that we've talked about several times on the webinars, and uh, easy to control or uh, to reduce their effect, I guess, with uh, fungicide. And so, again, just uh, you know, beware, be checking your fields. If uh, if you uh, weren't planning on spraying uh, at all, uh, I would just. Uh, Caution you to maybe go out and check some of your uh, some of your wheat fields at least. Uh, they uh, definitely uh, are the ones I've been in. Uh, even you know they, they're 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 heavy crop this year, and uh, there's lots of material and the canopy's staying wet, so the potential is there for for disease to be an issue. I've also been getting a few calls about some purpling showing up in uh, in leaves and. Uh, and you know, uh, it's uh, we're we're seeing a lot of different things too. And this is, I'm seeing some purpling, uh, getting calls about purpling, but I'm also getting some calls just about some uh, some browning, more like uh, say this third leaf here. I got this picture from uh, Pam Jarotny sent it out, and they were getting it in the lab at uh, at Winnipeg, and and uh, it's. Uh, whether it be brown or the purpling, uh, we're, we're seeing some stress ish issues out there on some of the crops, and uh, the reason we're seeing that is because of some of the some of the conditions we've had uh, over uh, the last uh, last while. Whether it be uh, uh, you know we've had hot and humid conditions, we've had the excess moisture, uh, we really haven't had a lot of low temperatures yet, or uh, drought issues, but I think the, the biggest thing is we've had some stresses on the crop and with that, those stresses sometimes you get some abnormal growth, you just get some, uh, uh, the crop just showing that it, uh, it, it, it can't handle all the stresses and so things are starting to show up on them. The purpling, uh, 
we've seen that before in some of the uh, the varieties like Cane and Glen, and uh, we see that pretty much on a on a yearly basis. So if you're growing those two varieties, or have producers that are growing those varieties, and they're mentioning to you something about purpling on the leaves, that's something that we see fairly normal with those varieties, and 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 it usually outgrows it without a problem. And uh, uh, but we are seeing. Uh, these type of symptoms showing up on, on other varieties this year. And uh, I guess I'll bring that up because uh, uh, we're getting calls, you know, on side hills, uh, you know, I'm spraying the crop and there's some yellow patches showing up on the field and uh, we're getting, you know, calls about wheat streak mosaic, we're getting calls about, uh, um, you know, barley yellow dwarf and, uh, and when you get out and take a look at those, uh, those fields, the symptoms aren't uh, aren't the same. Uh, they're more of a, uh, a browning, almost like a mold, moldy slash mildew type uh, symptom. And uh, so not really characteristic of any of the wheat streaks or the, the barley yellow dwarfs. And uh, so uh, I guess uh, we're seeing it. Uh, it's pretty much all related back to stress. And uh, if we get some dry conditions with some good growing conditions, I think a lot of the plants are going to outgrow them. I was in a field of oats uh, uh, this week and uh, was there the one day and looking at the, the older leaves were the ones that were still still up and noticeable from the road and it definitely had a brownish tinge to them but when you got into the field and seen the next two leaves that were coming they were perfect and nothing to them so basically just the stress was causing those, those uh, leaves to get some browning to them so again just something that we've been seeing out there over the last little while. Wanted to throw in a slide about the corn, and the corn is definitely jumping. Uh, this was one that was uh, I had taken and put in last week's uh, webinar, and uh, you know this week's webinar we thought or for this week's corn we probably could add another two feet onto this one. And um, it's interesting if uh, you know in a field like that, uh, probably in a week's time we'd be seeing uh, pretty much all the plant parts already uh, in in that stem. And if we went and cut it open, we'd be seeing everything, the tassel and everything. And, and everything already. So that'll be something I plan to do for next week's webinar is to, uh, to grab some of those ones and show them. But just uh, keep loving and, and conditions are perfect and uh, growing degree days are getting close to being where they need to be. So we're definitely seeing the corn and, and jump right now. A little bit about some chemical issues. Uh, we've been getting uh, some calls regarding some things happening in the field, so just wanted to uh, show a few of them. Uh, Elmer sent a couple pictures this week from uh, his area, and uh, if you've been seeing some drift issues uh, on uh, on canola, and here's a fairly common one. You've got the curling of the, the stems, or the twisting of the stems, and uh, usually characteristic with a phenoxy issue. So uh, basically just a, a drift issue from a neighboring field, and I mentioned that off the start that we're we're seeing some of the later crops that are being sprayed that they just need to be very uh, cautious of how you're spraying because a lot of the the other crops that are neighboring are very uh, in a very sensitive stage right now and uh, don't take a lot of chemical to uh, to show some of the uh, the symptoms and uh, and reduce some of the uh, the yield potential. Also, you can the same type of symptoms you would see purpling of uh, of the stems, which is you know just another another phenoxy type issue. Another one that Elmer was seeing was some group two injury in canola, uh, and a few one of the characteristics with that one would be the excessive branching when uh, it's uh, when the when it's picking up the group two. So whether it was a, a drift or picking it up from the soil, definitely uh, you can see the excessive branching there and. This picture is a real good one. It definitely shows it here where um, it's almost like the plant is overcompensating to try to produce seed. And what happens is it just uh, starts to uh, produce a bunch of shoots out of every, uh, every um, uh, leaf attachment and every, every area it can just to try to, uh, to produce buds. So uh, again, just uh, uh, another example of, uh, of group two injury and uh, again, something that is showing up. Uh, we're we're actually seeing and getting a lot more calls regarding group two. And while we're talking about group two, like you know, just uh, with uh, with that, I think uh, throughout the whole growing season, we've had issues with uh, group two. And I think producers need to be 
uh, aware of the products they're using now and try to be uh, use be uh, better rotation because uh, we're seeing issues in wheat this year. We're seeing issues in canola, and uh, you know just to be uh, be careful of your with your chemical rotation. A little bit of an insect update now. I guess insect activity in cereals and oil seeds uh, has decreased over the past week. Uh, with the ones that we were dealing with, and that's mainly the flea beetles and the cutworms. Uh, so those ones have gone down over the past week. Um, uh, the alfalfa weevil, uh, we were getting a fair few calls this week regarding alfalfa weevil in, uh, in the alfalfa stands. And uh, producers, basically the, basically the only way to control them right now would be to get out there and cut it, but the problem is, is weather conditions haven't been great, so a lot of producers have been kind of holding off. And because of that, we're just seeing a little bit more damage happening to the alfalfa. I haven't been in a field that has been really severe. Uh, the numbers have been high in the traps that we had in the, uh, in the, uh, the Shoal Lake area or Elmer's area, and uh, so uh, I know those, uh, that, that field of traps we're in uh, has been cut and bailed already. And that's pretty much the best thing producers can do uh, right now is if you're seeing the alfalfa weevil being damaged, uh, try to get it, as, get it cut as quick as you can. Uh, regarding Bertha armyworm, um, I guess there's a, there is uh, the moths are being monitored and in most areas right now the numbers are fairly low. However, we do have some uh, high numbers being reported in the eastern part of of my area here, like so, basically through that Wallonisa, Killarney areas, uh, Nesbit area, throughout there, and they're getting numbers uh, in the 600 plus range. So uh, uh, I guess uh, those are high enough numbers where I would be concerned, and uh, and these, and basically we're, what we're catching is moss and moth traps right now, and so you know if we're catching those type of numbers. Uh, we could have a hot spot showing up. Uh, we have had it in other years, though, where we've been catching large amounts of moss, and then it never amounted to any issues later on. So, again, just uh, uh, if you're growing canola, it wouldn't be hurt. It wouldn't hurt to just keep an eye on the canola, and when you're scouting in your fields, anyways. Uh, the other one that we should probably be looking at scouting for is. Uh, is the uh, diamondback moth. It'll be out there fairly soon too. So when you're scouting for Bertha, be ready to scout for diamondback moth. Uh, wheat midge, uh, the activity so far has been reported to be uh, relatively low and, uh, and probably makes sense because our growing degree days were a little bit behind and uh, I got a, a few slides regarding the wheat midge and uh, this is our wheat midge uh, emergence map. Uh, and it's uh, as of uh, June the 30th. And uh, I put on the bottom of the map, you can see here where uh, we need 693 degree days before we see 10% emergence, and then 784 before we see 50% emergence. And uh, as of June 30th, you know, basically throughout, uh, you know, Shoal Lake was in the 500s, uh, Verdon was in the the 550s to 575s, uh, Killarney was in the 525s, well, we saw 550s to 575s, you know, Brandon in the 550 range. So we were definitely in the in the range area where we were in that 10% uh, or below for emergence. So you can see where uh, that was a good thing. I went and I. Uh, uh, grabbed the growing degree days and uh, and then our actual as of uh, as of yesterday, I guess it would be. And so if you look at those areas, and uh, just to go back a slide here, uh, 693 is uh, to 693 to 750 is where we would have up to 50 percent emergence. And uh, when you look down the down the, the chart here, we're we're definitely not at the 750, but we are probably approaching the 10 percent emergence. And uh, the good thing about that is uh, I did mention with the uh, fusarium control, a lot of the, the wheat is, is approaching the completion of flowering, and with that the glooms are going to close. And wheat midge need that gloom open to, in order to lay their eggs. So uh, with that, I think uh, a lot of the wheat that, uh, 
is out there right now is probably in a situation that it's uh, it's going to be uh, uh, it'll be too late for the midge when they do emerge to to do any major damage. So uh, uh, I guess some of the later fields or some of the ones where we could see some pressure on though. So I guess uh, that's one of the good things so far with the uh, with the wheat midge and the emergence. Um, grasshoppers, uh, those levels are fairly high in some areas. I was kind of hoping that uh, the wet conditions were going to drown them out, but uh, we're definitely seeing um, in some of the areas uh, and uh, basically the hatching areas where you're seeing them now. So if you go through the ditches and on the, the sides, uh, usually side hills are areas that are kind of facing the, the sun sort of thing. Uh, you'll see that's where a lot of the grasshopper eggs get planted and that's where you'll see some of your larger populations and so right now that's what we're, we're seeing. We're just seeing a lot of them in those areas and uh, that's the place where the easiest, they're the easiest to control as well because at that stage um, they're, they're not able to fly yet so basically they, uh, they're just uh, in a kind of a concentrated area so if you are seeing high numbers and you have some concerns that's the easy time to control. And a lot of times, uh, a spraying of a headland uh, would be uh, would be something to that would uh, that would work uh, really well um, for guys that are, are haying and, and taking the hay crop off. Uh, that would be one thing to watch for uh, if you've got a, a fairly large population in some areas right now, and uh, you wanted to uh, keep them under control then uh, it wouldn't maybe be a bad idea after you've taken your cut to go and do a headland just to control them because if not uh, they definitely do and like uh, young, uh, young alfalfa and uh, grass plants as they're coming up and they can do a fair bit of damage if you get a good population. So that would be something to watch for as the first cut uh, comes off and, uh, and a lot of producers are, are doing that right now. mentioned a bit about the birth of armyworm already, so uh, just another slide in there saying that the, the hot spot areas that uh, we're seeing and uh, and also mentioned about the, the checking for the diamondback moth. Last week uh, Elmer sent a picture of a hemp field in the Strathclair area and uh, just to show you what a, a week will do, it's probably grown another foot taller and uh, looks like a really thick crop of hemp, so it'd be interesting to see how tall this stuff gets by the end of the year. Just about uh, done my part of the presentation and I uh, just wanted to miss our, the presentation for today and I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, there's going to be a disease scouting uh, clinic on July the 30th at CMCDC at Portage de Prairie and it's at the Ultimate Canola Challenge site. So uh, basically it's uh, uh, the, the chance to go out there and uh, do some hands-on scouting for disease, uh, you know, pick, picking out symptoms and identifying uh, lesions. So a, a good day, it's going to start at 9.30, uh, our registration's at 9.30 and coffee's at 10. They would like to uh, call in to let them know you're coming or if you could to email uh, uh, Kristen Phillips at the Canola Council, uh, they're, uh, they're having lunch brought in so they'd like to know the numbers. I guess just a, a top up to that meeting, they're going to have bring in Jim Bessel uh, to run a, a combine seed lot station at the event. So uh, if you uh, are, uh, have, uh, have producers or if you're a producer and you want to go and just, uh, just as somebody talked about the different things you can do to measure losses coming out of the, the combine it would be uh, uh, a good uh, good event to attend and uh, so uh, again that's going to be on uh, July the 30th uh, in Portage. I guess with that Linda is there any questions? Uh, Lionel there was just one question it was about asking about a wheat midge map which you answered in your presentation so this time I don't have any questions so Okay, well, uh, I guess with that, uh, regarding getting the CCA credits, uh, uh, if you uh, are watching this uh, on the recorded webinar, uh, we just need you to write a short summary on, on what was discussed today, and then you can send that in to myself or Linda, and preferably Linda, 
and uh, she will make sure you get uh, get your credits. And once again, there's the contact information for Linda and myself. So if you have issues or, or if you want us to uh, uh, get information for you or see what's going on in your fields, give us a call. And again, here's the, uh, the information for the MAPRI FBA and Southwest and South Parkland uh, with Almer, Murray, Amir, Melissa, and Andrea. So um, that's where they're located and that's their numbers. I guess with that, I think that's uh, everything I have to present today. Uh, I think the big thing for this coming week is to uh, watch for the timing uh, so we're not going out there after the fact and spraying, uh, you know, spraying uh, products that uh, aren't going to give us much, much aid anymore. So with that, if you, uh, we will end the web webinar for today.